Welcome to the second video in my TR808 restoration series. Um, this time I'm doing the power supply. Uh, and the reason why I needed to do that is I had the 110 volt Japanese version, um, which came with this transformer. And I needed to change it to a 240 volt transformer, um, which is similar to the one that's in this CSQ800. And also <clears throat> the capacitors on the main supply are electrolytic capacitors and they tend to dry out and not regulate very well after 10 years or so. And this is a 30 year old instrument so um, they were due for a change. Uh, I'm not going to do any circuit mods on this one. Um, there's plenty of information available on the internet about them. This is actually quite interesting, um, if you're, especially if you're an electronics nerd like me, um, <clears throat> Roland actually used um, um, a transformer with multiple windings. So this is not one of your more modern transformers like this one that has um, uh, multiple taps on the secondary windings. You can see here there's 0, 15, 17 and a half uh, and a whole lot of other voltages. Um, these transformers were manufactured a little bit differently. It's literally uh, different wires soldered onto different points on the secondary winding to make it shorter or, or, or longer. Um, now that's not what Roland did. And normally the only reason why you would completely separate these voltages into different windings that didn't touch each other is because you wanted electrical isolation between those. Um, and that was quite common, um, particularly with Roland synthesizers of the time, where they had um, multiple grounds to separate parts of the circuit, like you know your normal analog to digital grounds, or just sensitive parts on the circuit. Like in the, the Jupiter 8 VCO, there's probably seven or eight supply rails and two different um, ground rails and that's just to separate sensitive parts of the circuit to the other parts of the circuit and some chips needed different voltages and all that kind of stuff. Um, now in the 808 um, the main circuit board only has one ground so it's all common it's, it's quite simple but Roland used a transformer with two separate windings and the power supply that's attached to the transformer has two separate grounds so it's as if it's set up to isolate uh, the analog supply from the digital supply or to just completely isolate one half of the board from the other for noise reasons or, or something like that. But once the wires go to the main board, it's all joined together anyway. Um, so I don't quite understand why they did that. Now, when I've decided to change the transformer, um, I've stuck with the two separate windings just so that it's it's like the original. So this one was 110 volt um, primary winding and it had your, your normal step downs um, for the smaller voltages. Um, I couldn't find a new transformer that had separate windings. They were all the multi-tapped versions, so one winding with a whole lot of wires coming off that winding. Um, so to keep it original, I've changed to two separate transformers so that the windings are still separate. And what this means is that once voltages go to this board, the grounds are still kept separate, so they're isolated. Um, but again, once it gets to the main board, they're joined together anyway. So I could have used a multi-tap transformer here and it would have worked fine, but I've decided to keep it the same as the original. So if we have a look at the schematic, you can see here there's two completely separate windings. See this one's multi-tapped, it's got a center tap, but the 5 volt, well, the one that's used to generate the 5 volts, is kept separate as if it's isolated from the rest of the instrument. And that's not uncommon because the chips that run off 5 volts, the digital chips, um, they introduce a lot of noise onto the line because the, the processors when they um, 
uh, when they change state, so like you've got a clock coming into the processor and every time it changes state there's a whole lot of transistors inside the processor that change at the same time. And so you get these huge inrushes of current when the clock changes and then nothing. So they introduce a lot of high um, noise <clears throat> onto this 5 volt rail. So I understand why they would be separate. But again, on the main board, they're not. They're the same. So I don't quite understand why. Um, Moog did this a lot, actually, but Moog were quite smart. Moog put a whole lot of little tiny capacitors throughout the board to shunt the noise um, so that noise from one part of the circuit didn't affect the other part of the circuit. So if noise was generated somewhere, while it travelled along the, the supply rails, there would be a little tiny capacitor shorting out those supply rails, so the noise would just bypass and get cut out. But the, the lower frequency DC current would just keep going straight through. So you'll notice on a lot of Moog synths, there's a whole lot of little capacitors everywhere. Um, and of course, ARP didn't include any because they were tied to us. <laughs> Um, on Roland, I guess there's a few, I haven't checked, uh, there is a few on the schematic, um, but they're often quite larger values than I expect, you can see them here. Um, and again, there's only one ground symbol on the main board, and I've confirmed that by testing um, these two points here, there's a ground for the 5 volt, uh, hang, ground here and a ground here. So if we connect them now. ground one and two here and you can see that it's like it's only a few ohms between them so essentially they're together uh, but anyway I've used two separate transformers for the windings are separated to keep it like the original now the only other thing I had to do when I converted this from 110 volts to 240 volts um, you have to be careful because uh, <clears throat> quite often instruments had some sort of protection so that if they generated noise, that noise wouldn't get back out to the mains voltage and affect other instruments. So you'll quite often see uh, in the cheaper designs, um, there's just a capacitor across the mains which will shunt the high frequencies to stop them getting out on, onto the mains. Um, so the capacitor that was in here was 110 volt rated and now I've changed it to 240 I've had to pull it out Oops. there so I've had to pull this out so this is 125 volt rated and that would have blown up if I'd plugged it into 240 now it doesn't affect the operation of the instrument it's across the mains and it's to stop high frequencies um, getting back out so I'm going to have to replace this with 240 volts that's just an X2 type um, capacitor. Um, the more modern way of doing this um, is via a, what's called a core comm or a line filter, um, which you can see I've put one on my modular synthesizer. So this has a filter in it to stop um, the high frequencies coming out and affecting other things. It's also got some spike suppression and, and other cool cool features too and the fuses built in which is really nice um, but they wouldn't fit in the 808 because we've only got this tiny little space here to bring the, the cable in so I can't use one unfortunately usually when I um, restore other synths um, there's more room and I'll, I'll put in a line filter normally uh, but on this one I didn't so I will put the a proper rated capacitor here but it still works without it because um, it doesn't affect the supply the only other thing I've done is replace these main filter caps you can see they're quite smaller than the original supply the bigger you have these integrating caps the smoother the supply and the easier it can deal with high currents without getting rippled um, and there's some output ones after the regulator um, that I've changed to be a bit bigger as well. Okay, so I'm going to uh, test the voltages now um, from the power supply, but before I do that, um, I'm going to make sure it's safe because um, I don't want to die when I turn it on. Um, so I'm going to do an electrical safety test. So it's a class one device, which means that it has a metal case and it has a ground 
Um, class 2 devices are like the TB303, um, TR606, um, which have plastic cases. Um, and if a wire comes loose on the mains and it touches a plastic case, um, you're not going to die because the wire, uh, the, the, the current can't travel through the plastic body. But because this has a metal body, if a wire comes loose on the mains and touches the metal, um, that would be really, really dangerous. So we need to test it as a class 1 device, which means we're also testing for earth in the body. Um, earth continuity is 0.2 ohms, so we've had an earth. And then next, an insulation test. Uh, this one puts 500 volts down both the active and neutral wires and then checks to, to see that none of that voltage makes it makes its way to the case. So that's greater than 200 mega ohms resistance, so that's pass two. So uh, I can turn it on now and test uh, the outputs of the supply and I'll show you how to do that. Okay, so we're live now, we're plugged in to the mains voltage, so I'm not going to use my fingers to point at places. Um, so the first thing is between pins uh, 18 and 19, we need five volts, which we're getting approximately, which is good. And between pins 21 and 22, there you go, between pins 21 and 22, we need about 15 volts. So we're getting that, which is good. And between pins, where, where are we? Between pins 20 and 21, uh, we need minus 15. So we're done. The power supply changes are finished and it's all back together and tested. Um, but the most important test hasn't been done. And that's this test, which is the most fun test. Um, and I'm very excited about it and um, I'm glad you're here with me to do it. So let's go. Excellent. All right, so that's good. So that's the end of the second video. Um, I may do some calibrations later on. Apart from that, uh, we're done. So thanks for watching.